Hopefully you're more relaxed now all the work is finished, you've all written your essay, hopefully. Um, as far as I know, all of the essays which were submitted, they've all been graded by one of five ELA teachers. We've put comments on for areas where you can improve these, so do improve them. This is what writing is about. You write it, you get feedback, you make it better, you get more feedback, you make it better, and your writing's quality goes up. So we've taken the time to give you guys some comments. Do look at the comments and improve your papers. Got some tape, yeah. Okay. We lost the clip for the microphone, so I'm wearing sellotape today, yeah. Anyway, today's lecture is going to be a bit more fun, hopefully. I'm going to be talking about presentations. Most people are not good at doing presentations. In fact, most people make really boring presentations. That's why this is a very common sight in lectures, in conferences, at symposiums. People fall asleep easy. So the number one rule of presentations is don't be boring. I'm not kidding. Don't be boring. If you can get your audience interested in things, oh, really? Oh, and they have this kind of attitude, that's what you want during the presentation. You don't want to bore the audience. So today's presentation, I'm going to show you some techniques you can use to make your presentations more interesting and how to make them not be boring. So, let's get started. Presentations then. There's usually four elements to a presentation. There's the content, which is the information that you put in your presentation. Because you need to have information in your head that you're going to pass to the audience. Then we have structure. This is the order of how we give that information. And the order is important, just like the order in your essay. Very important is the design, the kind of slides that you make. And I would argue most, 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 most important is the delivery. Delivery is the key to a good presentation. And I'm going to cover delivery techniques today as well. So let's quickly get through the basics. So we've got content. And for the content, there's something that I call the three A's. You have to be aware of this for presentations. The content must be accessible. It must be at a level that fits the audience. So, in this room, how many people know Draymon? Right, you all know who Draymon is. You know he's a blue robot cat, no ears, doesn't like mice, doko demodor, all that kind of stuff. If I go to Scotland and I'm giving a presentation to high school or university students in Scotland and I say Drymon, they'll go dry who? They've never heard of him. So the level of information, if my presentation topic is Drymon, would have to start much lower for Scottish people because they don't know he's a robot cat from the future. And you do. My presentation for you, the level of information would start higher. So you always need to think about the audience of your presentation and what do they know so the information is at an accessible level so that they can understand it. So that's the first A. The second A, it must be appropriate. The information has to be related to your purpose. If my purpose is to make you watch Draymond. There's no reason for me to talk about Mickey Mouse. It's not connected to the purpose, it's not appropriate. So I need to stay on the topic and make sure that what I'm saying in the presentation is related to the purpose of my presentation. If the purpose of my presentation is to get you to go to Hawaii on holiday, there's no point me talking about Okinawa. It has to be appropriate to my purpose. And the last thing about information that we need to consider is the information has to be attractive. It must be something that people find interesting. 
So that brings us on to the data itself and what I call the three H's. The data that you use, the information that you use, should be high quality information from good sources. Not, oh my friend told me, it must be true. That's not a high quality source. But if it comes from books, magazines, publications, reputable sources, that's what we want. And we also want high quantity information. You need a lot of it. So that you can deal with any questions that come up. And the information must also help you achieve your aims. If my aim is to get you to go to Hawaii on holiday, I need lots of information about Hawaii. So I always need to consider these things. So, moving on to the structure. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end. And the structure of your presentation should be well organized. People should recognize this is the beginning part. They should recognize this is the middle, and they should recognize this is the conclusion. It should be clear. They should be able to see this. And the structure should build credibility and trust. Now, I'm presenting to you guys today. I'm giving you a presentation. I'm giving you a lecture. And the subject of my presentation is presentations. Why should you listen to me? Why am I the expert on presentations? Why am I able to teach you about presentations? Well, at the beginning of my presentation, I need to tell you something about me so that you understand why I know a lot about presentations. Well, for a start, these lectures on the startup program, I've been doing most of them for the past three years. I give guest lectures invited by the students for the Open Campus. I know for the ICU Festival. I've also been doing the Open Campus lectures. I present at conferences around the world all the time. I teach classes and presentations. I read a lot about modern presentations theory. So I know a lot about presentations. What I have just done now is what you need to do at the beginning of your presentation to tell the audience why they should listen to you. You're building credibility and trust. I know what I'm talking about because blah, 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 blah. And you're telling the audience why you're the expert on your topic. It could be, today I'm going to talk to you about teenagers in Japan. I've been researching this topic for three months. Okay. You've told us you've been researching it for three months. You know something about it. You've given us some credibility about yourself. So you need to start by telling the audience something about you so they know why you're the expert. Now that's the beginning. At the end, you also need to leave time for a Q&A session because people will have questions. So we start at the beginning telling them about you and why you're the expert and we give them time at the end for any questions and in the middle is where your presentation is. Now, what do you present? Well, this is very important. You have to know what you're going to present. And I always tell people, present what you know and love. If you know something, you can present it without notes. Notes are really bad in a presentation because you will want to read them. And reading in a presentation is really boring. If this is my notes, and I have notes, it's so easy for me to start reading my notes. Today, I'm going to tell you about presenting. I'm going to tell you how to do a re boring, 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 boring. I'm reading to you. Don't read to your audience. You could print it out, email it to them, and they can read it themselves at home. A presentation is about you talking to the audience, making a connection to the audience. And you can only do that without notes if you know the information. Now, I can talk to you about something, but I don't have a passion. And the audience want to feel your passion about the subject. They want to feel you really love the subject. So for me, if I had to do a presentation to you guys, and they said to me, do a presentation 
on Apple. This would be easy for me. I love Apple products. I have an iPhone, an iPad, an iPod, a laptop, a desktop, an iMac. I use their products all the time. I have a passion for them. I like their products. It would be easy for me to do this presentation. I know a lot about it and I have a passion for the products. Now, if they said, Rab, you have to do this presentation. Come on, come on. Oh, um, okay. Um, Windows computers, they are good. There's no passion here. <laughs> and the audience can feel that. They can feel there's a passion or there's no passion. So you should be very selective about what you choose to present. Because the audience can feel how much you believe in what you're saying. So choose what you know and choose what you love. Now here, does anybody know who this is? Anybody know this guy? His name is Steve Ballmer. And he's CEO of Microsoft. Now, you're going to see a couple of video clips of him, and these are examples of what not to do in a presentation. Now, the first thing is don't wear a light shirt if you sweat a lot. <laughs> because it's not, not a good idea. Wear something dark, yeah? Now, watch this. Now I suggest you don't have that kind of reaction with you. Come on, get clapping, get clapping. It's not very good. If the audience wants to clap, they'll clap. If they don't want to clap, they don't want to clap. Now look at the difference here. This is another entry by the same guy. I suggest you never do this. Get up! Now he's wooing so much when he has to speak, he's ah, 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 he's out of breath. See, he can't speak now, he's so out of breath. I have four words for you. I love this company. Yeah! <laughs> now certainly, 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 the passion is there. <laughs> and the knowledge is there. But it's not a very professional way to start your presentation. So I don't really suggest that as a model. Now, let's look at a different Steve. A very different Steve. And wait till we see the entry difference. He hasn't said anything and already the audience is starting to clap because they know he's a good presenter. Hasn't even done anything yet. But in the past, he's done so many good presentations that people recognize this and they're giving him the clapping, standing ovation before he's started. And when we see when he starts to speak, he does a couple of interesting things. Eventually, he does start to speak. Eventually. I'm 
very happy to be here today with you all. And uh, as some of you may know, about five months ago, I had a liver transplant. So I now have the liver of a... So he had a liver problem, and he had to get a new liver. ...who died in a car crash, and was generous enough to donate their organs. And he's telling us a sad story about a young man who died, who had the card to donate his organs so that he got the liver from a young man who died. And he's saying that we should all be like this young man who did a very good thing. So he's telling us a sad story. Now, just pause that a second. Now, why is he telling us a sad story? Well... In our bodies, whenever we feel emotion by feeling sad, or by happy by laughing, or even by being scared or shocked, at these times of emotion, our bodies produce dopamine. It's a chemical, it goes around the body. And one of the effects of dopamine is when the dopamine is in the body, our ability to remember things goes up. So really good presenters, if they have something important to say, some key piece of information from their heads they want to give to the audience, before they give them that key piece of information, they will make them laugh by telling them a joke. They will make them sad by telling them a sad story. Ah! Or they will scare them. So now I've scared you. Dopamine is in your body now. You felt the emotion. So whatever I say next, you have a better chance of remembering because the dopamine is flowing in your body. And that's what good presenters do. They use the emotions of the audience, make them laugh, make them sad, make them cry, make them be really ecstatic, shock them. It helps that dopamine get produced. It helps them remember things. And that's what good presenters do. Over and above all of this, the one other thing that you have to remember is have fun. The best people in the world at anything, you know, and here's Messi, he's one of the best football players in the world. Even though he plays maybe 70, 80 games of football a year, he always looks like he's having fun. You should enjoy what you're doing. I enjoy being here today giving this presentation. And you need to send a signal to your audience that you too are having fun. Now that means just have a little slight smile on your face to show that, not hee <laughs> not like that, but just a little smile on your face to show that you know, you're kind of enjoying being here, you're having fun. That's a good signal to communicate to the audience. Now, doing all of these things isn't easy. We need to plan all this out in advance. Now, one of the best things about planning, I always suggest to students, is use post-it notes. You all know what post-it notes are. If you sketch out your ideas for each slide on a post-it note, and we stick the post-it notes on a wall, so here's number one, here's number two, here's number three. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's really easy to move the post-it notes around to make the flow of the presentation the way you want it to be before you get near the computer. Also, if you color code the post-it notes, this is very useful. So if you have a video clip, maybe the video clip is a blue one. If you have photos, maybe they're yellow. If you have text, maybe they're white, and we have different colors for different kinds of slides. And what you want to do is to mix them up. You never want to have too many slides the same. This is something called segmentation theory. If we do anything the same again and again and again and again and again and again and again, the audience get bored. But every five or ten minutes, if you keep changing, the audience stays awake. So, if I keep playing you, here's a video, and here's another video, and here's another video, and here's another video, and here's another, soon you're bored of the videos and you start to get sleepy. But if I play some videos, then stop. Then I talk to you for five minutes, stop. Then I show you some photos for five minutes, stop. Then I change to some videos. And by keep changing the dynamic, changing the mo modality of delivery, you keep the audience's attention high. 
And having these colour-coded post-it notes, they help you see are the colours mixed up because that's what they should be if you've got a segmented presentation. And also, things come in threes, just like writing. Three beers are always better than one beer, especially in a warm day. So in your presentation, you should follow the rule of threes. There's an introduction, there's a body, and there's a conclusion. Similar pattern to your writing. Now at the beginning, you need to get the attention of the audience. And you need to keep their attention. Now, there's loads of different ways to do this, but the information has to be delivered in an attractive way. This means don't read to the audience because that's boring. But even when you're not reading, even your voice is important. Now, Japanese is a relatively flat language. But if you speak with every word has the same intonation, very soon the audience will be bored with your way of speaking. Boring. So modulate your voice. Sometimes, for the really important parts, we're raising the tone. So your voice is also useful in delivering information in an attractive way. And if you deliver it in an attractive way, the audience keeps you with their attention. And you always want to finish on a high note. When we get to the end, we want to finish on a kind of positive note. Good way to finish. But most, 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 most important is you're going to have to practice it. And then practice it again. And then practice it some more. And then practice it again. Professionals like Steve Jobs, when they do a presentation, they've probably practiced it dozens of times. So they don't need the notes. And they know what's coming next. Now, for practice, there's a couple of things we can do. Um, you, I guess you guys have all got a computer, yeah? Um, how many people's computer has a camera on the computer? Quite a lot of you, yeah? Now, these cameras, they're very important devices. Let's see if I can demonstrate this. Let's go here. And check display. Yeah. There's my quick time. Let's find that. Quick time, quick time. Where are you? Aperture. Ah, here we go. Quick time player. Okay. Now, let's see if I can get this to work. File. New movie recording. Come on, come on. Come on. Startup disk is almost full. Okay, tell me something I don't know. Okay, now if I turn this camera around, hopefully, doo -doo 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 -doo, hey, you can see me. <laughs> and I can practice my presentation. Now, if I click record, let me just click record. Hey, we're recording. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to my presentation. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about presenting and how body language is really, really important for presenting. Now, most people have got some weird things they do with their body and they don't even know they're doing these weird things with their body. And they never get the chance to see themselves either, so they never learn. Now. Just by recording yourself, practicing your presentation. Now, let's see if my memory has enough space. Okay. We can watch ourselves. Nice gestures. Not such a nice gesture. Not such a good gesture. Not such a good gesture. So, if you... Let's just switch that off. Okay. So, if you use your camera like this... Let's get back down here. 
for the practice. You have a chance to get feedback on your own body. Maybe it's something like you're always scratching your head or for the girls you're always flicking your hair. There's always some body thing you have which isn't very good. And if you record yourself doing the practice, you can look at yourself, you can identify your bad points and get them out. So you've got some of these tools. If you've got a camera on your computer, it's a very useful way to do your practice. Okay, moving on. Let's get to design. Very important part. When we write a word on the slide, car, if you're going to remember car, your brains don't remember C-A-R. We don't really remember text. What our brains do, cognitive scientists have found this out, is when we have a word that we're going to remember, our brains convert it to an image and we store the image in our brains. Now, if you have a word on a slide, and there's only one word, it's easy for people to identify the word, create an image and store it in the head. But if we have many, 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 many words on the slide, the audience has to read all the words, identify the key words, and then create images, and that takes time. And while they're doing that reading, the presenter is speaking, blah, 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 blah. And the presenter's speaking is distracting their reading. So three days later, after these kind of presentations, when they've been given memory tests, the average memory of the presentation is about 10%. But if the presentation uses slides which have lots of images and not lots of words, and if the image is connected to the key point, three days later, when they've been given memory tests, they can remember 65 to 70 percent of the information. Now, the purpose of a presentation is to take the information from your head and put it into the head of the audience. If they can only remember 10 percent, that's a waste of a presentation. So you want to make the presentation in a way that the audience can remember. So, using images. Now what I'm going to do next, I'm going to put a slide on the board. And I want all of you to start reading the slide. And when you've finished reading the slide, I want you to put your hand up. And I'm going to time you how long it takes to read the slide. And this is a real slide from a real presentation. Go. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Information is really important. Blah, 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 blah. The Iraq war, really important. What's going on? Lots of people dying. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Now I'm going to walk in front of my own slide. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. The Iraq war, very, very interesting. What's going on? It's terrible. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah, very interesting information. I'm chatting to the audience. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. More information. Blah, blah, blah. Still no hands going up. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah, more information, still no hands going up, blah, 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 blah. Now, that's one minute. No one has finished reading the slide. And I will guarantee you, during that one minute, most of you were not listening to me. Most of you were trying to read that slide. So that means everything I've said in the last minute is a load of blah blah blahs because you didn't pay any attention. You were too busy reading the slide. I've wasted my voice. This would be a terrible slide. But it's a real slide and it's the kind of slide you see in presentations all the time. This is even worse. Where people put their whole essay on the slide and then they hold the essay and then they start reading the essay to the audience and next... Furthermore, in addition, blah, 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 boring, boring. This makes your audience go to sleep. Your audience essentially can look 
or they can listen. They can't really do two at the same time. If they're looking at a slide and reading the slide, they're not listening to you. If they're listening to you, they're not looking at the slide. And the eyes are the most dominant sense. People will look first. So we want to give them stuff that's easy to look at and easy to process. Now, if we see something like this, this is a radar screen, and we look at this, where's the airplane? Beep, there it's there. Where's the airplane? Beep, and we have to look really hard. That would be bad for a slide. The next slide I'm going to show you, this is a real slide, it's a Microsoft slide. Can anyone tell me what is the key point? What's the key point on this slide? Can anybody see the key point easily? No. There's too much information and it's all the same size. There's no one key point that jumps out at us. It's really difficult. You could look at that for 10 minutes and still not identify what the key point is, which makes it a bad slide. The slide should have a key point which is connecting to the information that I'm speaking. So here's an easy one. Very simple slide. Easy to see the key point, beer. But it doesn't look very stylish. But this is the kind of clip art which comes with PowerPoint all the time. And people use it. But it's really low class, really old fashioned. If I want a photo of beer, why not take an unusual beer photo? Still one key point, it's still keeping it simple, but it's a much nicer, more interesting photo. Now, the point about the photos is they have to match what you are saying. So I want you to keep the slides simple. Keep it simple, keep it simple, keep it simple. And there's an expression, keep it simple, stupid. It means if you don't keep it simple, you're stupid. And I want you to remember this. So my slide could be something like this. Because the slide matches my point, keep it simple, stupid. It's a cognitive match. It enables people to remember. And that is the purpose. The slides are there not to give information to the audience. The slides are there to help the audience remember the information that comes from you. You are the presenter. It's your presentation. The slides are there to help you. Now, we can use humor. I've already mentioned that funny is good. Funny makes people have dopamine. Funny makes them remember. So I could have a slide like this, where I'm talking about the really great American presidents at Mount Rushmore. They're all immortalized on stone. The best American president. Whoa, what's he doing there? <laughs> so you can have something funny in your slides. And my purpose about this slide, this was from a presentation I gave on the media to show how the media control the images or government control the media images. And I used humour as an example. It makes people laugh. Now, here's your typical PowerPoint slide. Um, I'm sure you guys know the Apple laptop called the MacBook Air. This would be a typical PowerPoint slide for the MacBook Air. We can see here, we've got a really old and terrible low quality battery clip art. We've got lots and lots of writing, most of it too small that you can't even read. But this would be a typical PowerPoint slide. And it would take people a long time to read this. And it's full of jargon. Memory of 52.5 gigabytes, a 1.37 gigahertz processor. But unless you're a computer geek, you don't even know what that means. So always try and keep the slides simple and explain things in a way that the audience can understand. So if we were doing a PSE slide, and this stands for picture superiority effect, it means using pictures instead of data, this is how it would look. Photo. World's thinnest notebook. It's very simple. It's very easy to understand. And the real information comes from your mouth because you're the presentation. You're the presenter, not the slides. Now, we can cut through that. We don't need that. Don't need that. We can fit that part. Okay, one other thing, as I mentioned before, avoid the unnecessary jargon. And this type of chart has got too many technical words and it's too complicated. But this is a real presentation chart used by the US military to give a presentation on Afghanistan. 
It looks like a bowl of spaghetti. You can't understand anything on that slide. Even if I gave you 10 minutes, you wouldn't understand that. There are too many arrows going all over the place. It's not a clear and easy to understand slide. Now, if we contrast this with a different type of slide, this one's much easier. We can see here, here is the percentages, here is the types of food, and we've got one colour for women and one colour for men. It's pretty easy to understand. Much simpler chart. Also in charts, we need to make sure that we start at zero. Look at this graph. Looks like quite a good increase, yeah? But it doesn't start at zero. Now because it doesn't start at zero, this looks to be double the size of this. But that's not true. Let's look at the same data if we make a real chart which starts at zero. Looks very different. Very, very different. So you need to make sure your charts start at zero so things are proportionately linked. Now, designing your slides. You need a style. So here's a slide. It's got one word. It's very simple, very easy to understand. And the real information comes out of my mouth. But look at that slide. Does that style match vampires? Most of the slide is white, which usually gives a good meaning. Vampires usually are bad. Look at the font style. This is a very tech type font. Vampires are not usually known for using computers. Although they'd probably use Windows ones if they did. <laughs> this would be a better slide. We've got an old parchment, we've got the fire, and we've got the gothic font. If I was talking about vampires, this would be a better slide. This would also be good. Land of Dracula. That would be a better slide, because the style of the slide matches my topic. Now look at this. Nothing special here. No real connection. This would be a better slide. The style matches the topic. Now this does actually work. It's very zen, very basic. But this would be better. The style matches the slide. Now, where do we put the words on the slide is also important. I've put this black writing right here in the middle of a white to draw attention to it. You cannot just put words randomly on the page. If I had put Zen here, it wouldn't have looked so nice. So the placement of the words is important. Look at this. This is my son at his local elementary school sports day. Something really wrong with this slide. Can anybody see it? It says, chase your dreams. And here's a young boy running, chasing his dreams. The only problem is, the dream is behind him. It looks like it's a nightmare and he's running away from it. The word is in the wrong side. Now look at the difference if I just move it. It looks better. Now the dream is in front of him and it looks like he's chasing the dream. This is even better again. Catch your dreams. And I've deliberately put the word dream next to his hand so it looks like he's jumping to catch the word dream. That's a much better design style. So this brings up design. And there's a design theory called crap. And basically, if you follow the crap theory of design, your slides are not crap. If you don't follow it, your slides are crap. Now what does crap stand for? Well, we've got C, which stands for contrast, R is repetition, A is alignment, and P is proximity. And these are all important elements on your slide. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you some of my slides that I've used for a real presentation and show you these design principles in action. Now, contrast. I have a white background 
So I've made the writing black. There's a big contrast that's easy to read. If I have a white background and I have pink or light grey writing, there would be low contrast, it would be difficult to read. Also, look at the size. Look at the size of the title is big. The subtitle is smaller. There's a contrast in size. It's easy to see. Now, the R is for repetition, using the same font, same style, same size. Here's my next slide. Same font, same size, same style, white slides. Same font, same size, same style. I'm repeating. Now, here's another slide. You probably remember this from my tech presentation last time. This is my real slides. Now look at the contrast. The word technology is at the top. If the technology was level with the bird, where the bird's wings are, where there's a lot of black, you wouldn't be able to read it. Similarly here. Same style, nature photo, repeating. Same fonts, same contrast. But look at this writing here. If I had put these words here, this would be difficult to read because this is dark and they're dark. So I'm putting them somewhere where there's a contrast and I'm repeating the style. And you guys have seen this before. Here's another one. You know, and here's another one. We can go through all of these and you can see there's a repeating of the pattern and there's a contrast all the way through. Running all the way through these. You've seen all these before, we don't need to spend so much time on these. These are all examples of the C and the R in action. Yeah, we've seen this. Okay, moving on to a different set. This is a different presentation you haven't seen. And this was a presentation I gave on the media. So it's got a different font. This font is called American Typewriter, and it's the kind of font that newspapers used to use. So the style is connected to the topic, which is the media and newspapers. Now look at how the words come out. They're coming out like a typewriter. Because that's the kind of, tick, 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 that's the kind of style that newspapers used to use. It's coming up. And I'm repeating the same style all the way through, and I'm keeping the contrast. You know, and here's a video. Uh, we don't need to watch the video, you get the idea. So here's the style going all the way through. So here's the images. Image control. This is a famous front page of an English newspaper in London. It's about Iraq. But it was actually a photoshopped painting, you should see. So I bring the photo up bigger. And then lining underneath it, I show you where the same thing has been repeated. Here's a guy, white, sh white jacket, black shirt, flat top, moustache, and here's the same guy here. They just took a few photos of a small group of people and photoshopped them together to make it look like a bigger crowd and put it on the front page of the newspaper. So here, I'm using shock to get the audience's attention, but look at the alignment. I've put the before and the after next to each other. So again, I'm using the crap design theories going on. Um, yeah, we probably don't need to see all of these. Let's just whiz through some more of these. Uh, you get the general idea. Yeah. Uh, let's go to a very different style. So this one was one that I gave on GM food. So it's very dark in tone. I think that corporations getting involved with food is a very bad thing. So the style that I've made up about modern corporations, it's all very dark in tone and very negative. You know, profits before people, this kind of stuff. You know, Coca-Cola image and reality. And so it's all very negative in tone because I've got a very negative interpretation here. So again, what's going on? is the style is actually matching the topic. You know, Fanta was a drink that Coca-Cola invented for the Nazis during World War II and so on. So again, there's, and I don't need to watch the video, but we can get the idea. Um, there's a whole load of different things going on that the style matches. Now here's one you guys should remember. If you've paid attention, you probably have seen these from our very first lecture. Same style, same fonts, 
same font size. And then here we've got a repeating style, university, village, it's academic, and it's argumentative, and it's achievable. And again, you can see I'm using the PSE style, I'm using an image to match the points that I'm actually making, as we whiz through. And here's another different one about Japan's population. Look at the font style, look at the sizes. And again, it's kind of repeating, the transitions are repeating, so I'm keeping the same style. And the slides are all very simple and very easy to understand, there's no messy graphs, everything's very clear. So we can see that the slides are helping my delivery. Because they've got memory photos and charts and things on them that match the words that I'm speaking. And this brings us to the last point, the delivery. Delivery is the key, 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 key thing to your presentation. Now, I've already mentioned dopamine, the wow factor. So this is dopamine. This is the thing that our bodies produce when we laugh, when we cry, when we get scared, when we're happy. And it helps us increase memory. So if you can start your presentation with some kind of joke or something to make the audience laugh, it does two things. It relaxes the audience and they think, hey, this presenter has made me laugh. Maybe they're not going to be boring. And the audience relaxes and the dopamine is flowing and they're more likely to remember what you say. And then you get to the real kind of information that you're going to give. Now, I've said this before, and I can't say it enough, delivery is the key, key, key thing. Most people think the presentation begins when you're here and you start speaking. Good afternoon, everyone. This is not when your presentation begins. Your presentation begins when everyone in the room knows you are the next speaker. So for example, if I'm sitting in the audience and the announcer says, our next speaker is Rab Patterson. Already you're thinking, oh, this is going to be so bad. Can I leave now? Because I don't look confident. I don't look relaxed. I don't look natural. And I haven't even started speaking yet. Presentation begins the minute, the second you stand up and start walking to the front. Because that's when people are looking at you. So your whole way of walking to the front should be confident, natural, relaxed. Yes, this is going to be easy. I can do this. No problem. You need to express confidence, relaxed, smooth, natural, all the way that you're walking down. So, so, so important. Then when you start speaking, you need to have eye contact with the audience. Pick someone in the audience, look at them until you've finished your sentence, choose someone else. Look at them until you've finished your sentence, choose someone else. Look at them until you've finished your sentence, choose someone else. Look at them until you've finished your sentence, choose someone else. Look at them until you've finished your sentence, choose someone else. Look at them until you've finished your sentence, choose someone else. Randomly moving around the room. So by the end of your presentation, everybody in this room, you've looked at their eyes and speaking only to you, 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 once, everybody in the whole room. And you're making a connection with that person in the audience. So the eye contact is important. Your way of moving is important. Even your way of standing. This is not a good way to stand for a presentation. A, it's not very relaxing, and B, it's very defensive. You want to stand in a more relaxed way. And you have a space, so move around. Sometimes I might be over here talking to this group of people. Sometimes I might want to move over here so that they don't feel neglected. And I'm talking to this group of people. There's about 100, maybe 120 people in the room today. Plenty of people for me to look at. I can keep looking at the eyes of the people 
all around the room. And that's what you need to do. Keep moving your eyes around the room because delivery is the key, 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 key to good presentations. So we've got a body language going on. We've got posture. Your way of standing should be relaxed. We've got movement. Placement is also important. You need to stand somewhere that everybody can see you. So for example, if I stand in here, you guys can see me. The people who are over here can't. The placement of where I'm standing would be really bad. Also, standing behind a desk is really bad because this puts something between the audience and me. And the only reason I keep coming over here today is because the battery on my remote control, I forgot to change it. So I need to keep coming over here to change the slides. But in between, I keep moving to the front. Because from here, my placement here makes it easy for everybody in the room to see me. That's what you want to do. Be in a place where everybody can see you. It's very important that they see you when you're presenting. Eye contact, most important thing. I've already mentioned that. You've got to have it. If you're reading, there's no eye contact. If you're looking up, there's no eye contact. If you're looking down, there's no eye contact. And generally, not always, but generally, if people look up to the left, it's because they've forgotten something and they're trying to remember what to say next. If they look up to the right, they're trying to imagine something. They're making it up on the spot. If they're looking down, they're not confident and maybe they don't believe what they're saying. So in your presentation, when you're, oh, I've forgotten what I'm going to say, blah, 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 oh, I'm lying to you, oh, I have no confidence, these are not signals you want to send to the audience. So don't send those signals. Keep looking at their eyes. Don't look up. Don't look down. Keep looking at the eyes of the audience. That's who you're making the connection with. And voice. Should be loud enough that everybody can hear. Now today that's not a problem, I got a microphone. But you know, maybe the room doesn't have a microphone. If I switch this off and then speak in my normal voice, the people at the back won't hear me. The people at the front will. So you need to make your voice louder or use a microphone. So you've got to make sure that it's loud enough everyone in the room can hear. It has to be clear. I'm from Glasgow. Glasgow accent is very, very strong. If I speak to you in a Glasgow accent, maybe most of you wouldn't understand. It's like Tohoku Ben for Japan. Really difficult to understand accent. So don't speak in though. Having a sound, I'm never going to sound like an American person, but hopefully it's clear and understandable. So you need to make sure that your language is clear and understandable. And most important is we want to feel the passion that you have for your subject. And that should come out in the voice, in the tone, in the words that you use, the gestures that you're using. We want to see the passion for your subject. There's nothing worse than listening to someone droning on about something they're not interested in. Last thing, gestures. You got hands, use them. Now today, a little bit difficult, one of my hands I can't use because it's holding the microphone, but I got another hand. If I want to say something is big, I can use a descriptive gesture and say, it's big. If I want to tell you I'm going to talk about three things, I can say I'm going to talk about three things. I've got descriptive gestures I can use. It's really big, it's really small, it's really fast. There's gestures I can do. There's also emphatic gestures. It's really important. They're gestures of emphasis. And again, you can use those. Gestures are very important. Now, some gestures might be okay in some cultures and in other cultures not. For example, in Britain, people don't do this. Imagine if you were American students and I said, hey, there's one thing I'm going to show you today. You wouldn't be very happy, yeah? We would say one thing with this finger, not that finger, yeah? Well, in Britain, British people don't usually do this gesture. For us, it's this has the same meaning. But Japanese people do this all the time. Can I have two, please? 
But if you do this in Britain, it's the same as saying, can I have one in America? It's got a very bad meaning. So you might want to turn it around this way to be safer. Pretend you're posing for a photo. So some gestures have a bad meaning in some places and a good meaning in others. So this is where you checking your audience before you do your presentation is very important. Who are your audience? What do they know? Do they agree with your topic or not? Do they know a lot? Do they know a little? What gestures are okay? What gestures are not? You'd want to check all that stuff before you start doing your presentation. So that's about as much as I wanted to cover today. Um, again, as usual, this slideshow will be up on the Net Commons you know, probably next week, something like that. Um, but the video will definitely be up very soon. You can go back and refer to this again. Do try and practice these things that I was showing you today in your own presentations. Because there's lots of teachers in the ELA. We will have to watch lots and lots and lots of student presentations. Please be nice to us. Don't be boring. If we have to watch a boring presentation, then another boring presentation, then another boring presentation, then another boring presentation, it's not very good for us. So don't be boring. Because if you are, we could be falling asleep because the presentations are boring. So try and make your presentations interesting and follow some of the guidelines and things that I've covered today. Anyway, we finished a little bit earlier than expected, which is good news for you. You don't have to listen to me anymore. You can go and have lunch and relax and take it easy. Some of you, I will be seeing you in April, I guess. Some of you will be in my class and some of you will be in the bigger lecture class where I'm doing the LLA stuff. So at some point in the next academic year, you probably will run into me. So do say hi, yay, I remember your startup lectures or wherever. Do say hello. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day today at ICU. Unfortunately, I won't be able to come to your tea cake thing this afternoon because I've got two classes to teach and I don't finish until 4.20 and I think you will be finished by the time I get there. So I hope you've enjoyed your time on the Startup Programme. Do improve the second draft of your essay because from next week we'll be having a look at your essays to see how you've changed them from the first draft. So, we're finished for today. Last thing to remember, don't be boring. And we're done. Thanks.